Welcome uh, to this third video in our series on looking at how we analyze trade-offs in land use decision-making and learning to use AHP as a tool. In this video, we're really going to try and give a practical guide to applying multi-criteria decision-making using a case study that we've undertaken in New Zealand. This work was funded by the Our Land and Water National Science Challenge. So really, we have four aims within this uh, video. We want to, first of all, as we said, show an example of how multi-criteria decision-making has been applied to land use in New Zealand. We want to briefly introduce the framework and how the tool works. And at the moment, we really are just introducing it. We will go into detail on the framework in later videos. We want to highlight the sorts of results that can be derived, how in a way that it can be used. And then finally, we want to look at some you know, potential advantages and disadvantages of the approach. As with all tools that we may use for analysis, this has some advantages, but also perhaps there are disadvantages. So it's in the case of thinking about, is this the right tool for you? But first, I really want to talk about some context about why we applied it in New Zealand to sort of highlight the sorts of questions that we might look at. So what we find is that New Zealand has had a very successful growth model uh, in the agricultural sector based on traditional farm enterprises. If you look at our exports and uh, earnings over the last few years, generally we've had an upward trend in the value of these. And so we've had a successful growth model really based on what we call you know, traditional dairy beef uh, farming systems. However, this growth has led to some challenges and the OECD and others have noted that really we are beginning to have some uh, severe environmental pressures being placed on New Zealand. We're finding unprecedented levels of water scarcity and quality issues. We have high per capita greenhouse gas emissions and a very high proportion of New Zealand's greenhouse gas emissions come from the agricultural sector. We have threats to our biodiversity. We have many species under threat, and we also have um, significant erosion. So we can see we have a whole combination of environmental problems, which suggest that our current agricultural systems may not be sustainable into the future. So this kind of means we can see, you know, due to things such as climate change and other factors, that New Zealand is facing both external and internal challenges to its current model of primary production. And it's been argued that simply carry on like we are, or even making small changes to our systems is not gonna be sufficient to enable these challenges to be addressed. So that we have, for example, lots of talk about sustainable intensification, about getting more from less, but maybe more around adopting best management practices, However, these generally could be viewed as incremental, incremental changes. So what we're kind of arguing is that this may not be enough and that actually we may be, need to transform into what we're calling here next generation systems. But I just want to sort of define really what we mean by next generation systems when we look at this. So these will effectively you know, include a redevelopment or redesign of existing enterprises and production systems. They may be wholly new or novel enterprises, or it may be the adoption of new technologies. And really what we want to see is ways that we can, you know, have value from our, our land, but really with a much lower environmental footprint. And that's sort of the challenge for our farming systems. But if we are going to transform our farming systems, then we need to realize that risk is really an important component in a transformation. Because adoption of new systems or technologies generally involves some risk to the business. They may be, for example, unproven in the farm situation, may involve capital investment, which may mean more borrowing, more risk because you're in debt to the bank, et cetera. You might have to change your management practice. You may have to change your whole farm system. And so there's a process of learning here. And there's risk associated with all these areas. 
However, we must also realize they can be the potential to be part of risk management strategies for businesses, because it may be these new systems actually are less risky uh, or the technologies are less risky. They may improve your profitability. They might reduce your variability in, in the product that you're producing. They may enable you to meet the environmental regulations or other regulations that have been placed on your business. So we can see that risk uh, it can be positive and be negative, but it is an important component in transformation. And one of the questions that was really in our project on next generation systems was the idea whether science can help de-risk the transformation process by providing more information. Now, what do we mean by next generation systems in, in practice? Well, if we can just think about new or different enterprises, we can see that there's a whole range of enterprises that have been discussed in New Zealand. Some of them kind of have been established, but maybe not flourished, others relatively new. So we talk about things such as Manuka honey, dairy goats, dairy sheep, che cherries, kiwi fruit, obviously well, well established now, truffles, hemp, et cetera. But which of these, in a sense, are appropriate for expansion for farmers to change their systems to? And again, we can see uh, from earlier work that we've undertaken, there's a vast range of novel products or, or existing products that could expand, that could fill uh, this gap. And generally, what we're saying is that we want, you know, in a sense, we're looking for systems that can add value or even higher value to our land use, but with a much lighter environmental footprint. But one of the things when we're thinking about how we adopt or whether we adopt these new systems is that we can't pick a winner, as we're trying to say. It's not that everybody should go to kiwi fruit, everybody should go to cherries, because it's very context specific. And that was the key thing. For different farmers, different systems, there's going to be different choices that are the right choice for them. And for example, there's a whole range of things that might be going on in New Zealand, which mean their context are different. In some areas in New Zealand, irrig new irrigation schemes are being uh, adopted, and that kind of then opens up a whole range of new enterprises. Other areas, maybe near very sensitive waterways, are, fa are facing very strong environmental regulation about the use of nitrogen, et cetera. So they have a slightly different problem there, you know, their pressure is how do they farm within these regulations? And, and as well, we have an expanding Maori agribusiness um, area. And again, and they're looking to ways that they can make um, add value to their traditional um, land systems and so on. So the kind of thing we're arguing that was we really need to understand the motivations and perceptions of the land manager in order to be able to facilitate this adoption of next generation systems. And this leads us to a number of questions, really. There's some, you know, to what extent are these various external incentives and disincentives influencing our land use decision making? What are the key perceptions and motivations of the land manager in determining land, land use? How much are land managers, play, how much weight are they placing? on these internal and external factors. And our general argument about why we undertook this analysis was that we can understand this better. We have a better chance of understanding what's needed in these, what we call next generation systems to help facilitate their adoption, which will then help us tackle some of these big challenges we have in New Zealand. We won't spend too long on this now, but effectively we developed a framework um, for thinking about this. And one of the key issues we were looking at here is how, in a sense, this line in the middle, the land manager motivations and perceptions. We're saying there's all this information coming through, all these signals are coming to farmers about change and maybe the need for change. And there's these new systems available compared to their old systems. And really it's about land manager motivations and perceptions related to the characteristics of their land, what can their land actually do, that then, you know, farmers may trial new systems or 
they may adopt them or not. And the sort of interaction of all these really will determine it. So in our analysis, we're really kind of interested in this land manager motivation and perception part of this framework. And so we just highlight that we felt that multi-criteria decision-making or multi-criteria decision analysis um, was an ideal tool for that. And as we've highlighted and you'll see in the reading, it's basically devoted to the development of decision support tools and methodologies to address complex decision problems because clearly land use change is a hugely complex decision making. There's many trade-offs that have to be made when deciding how to use your land. And again, we won't spend too long on this now. We will look in more detail in later videos about how we identified uh, the criteria that were important for us when we were looking at our multi-criteria decision-making framework. Um, but we found really that we put the, the sort of decision into six broad uh, categories of what we call domains. And we say farmers think about, or land managers think about financial, market, knowledge, regulations, social well-being, and environmental issues when they think about changing uh, their land use or how they use their land. And within these broad areas, there's also a range of what we call subdomains or sub-criteria it may be called. So for example, when we think about the financial, it might be thinking about how much investment you need, what the overall return on that investment will be, how much profitability per hectare you get, how long it takes to pay back, whether that profit's going to be variable, whether or not it's going to diversify your income. So we think you know, fundamentally, you know, we, at a high level, financial is important. At the more detailed level, these individual components are more detailed. So what we do is effectively identify these domains and these subdomains, and then we try and through the process of analytic hierarchical process, AHP, we get farmers to, in a sense, indicate the weight, the importance of these various components. So this is an example here where how we use it, just thinking about the level um, of the domain level, so that high level that we were talking about, so financial, uh, environment, knowledge base here. And what effectively analytical hierarchical process does is the pairwise comparison between these issues. So here we have financial performance here uh, against environment. And if we think the financial performance of the new system is going to be more important than the environmental footprint, we will move to the left here. And as we move further to the left, as we will see from these explanations here, it becomes increasingly more important. So as we go from three to five to seven to nine, then financial performance is highlighted more important than environment. If we go this way to the right, then environment is seen as more important than financial. And again, we move to the right. Don't worry about this too much now. We will talk more about this actual process in more detail when we look at it specifically. So for example, this is uh, an actual uh, process that we went through with a, a land manager. And we can see here, for example, when they're uh, comparing financial against market, they basically highlight much more weight on the financial side. And we can see their choices through this. And through this process, effectively, just using mathematical uh, formulas, we can generate uh, an indication of how important each of these are. So in this example, we can see if we think about the overall decision making being one or 100 or one, we can see that 0.33 of the weight of this would go to financial and knowledge base. So these were the two main areas of importance to this land manager here, environment, regulation, market, much less. So we can generate these weights of how important these criteria are when land managers are making their decision. And so we went through this approach with uh, uh, quite a number of case studies with farms or manage, landowners, land managers who were considering or had already changed their land use. 
And so we had a range of land managers ranging from small family farmers um, to larger family farmers, to corporate, um, we had hill farmers, trustees, et cetera. And we went through this process with the tool that we developed um, to look at their uh, motivations and perceptions through this process. So each time you go through uh, the framework, you generate this set of weights at both the domain level and that subdomain level, those individual criteria that we talked about. And we can just see some sort of results that come out of it. So on average of all those land managers that we spoke to, this is the weight that was given to those individual um, domains. So we can see here that of, out of one, you know, 0.2 or 20% of the weight importance in the decision making was given to financial factors. And in this on average, just slightly more than 20% was given um, to factors relating to the environment. And then we slightly less for market regulation, et cetera. It gives an idea of the overall importance of these different factors in their decision making. And then we can break that down from that high level, those domains to what we call the subdomains and see how important it specific factors were in here. So if we look down here, for example, we can see that environmental stewardship had came out particularly strongly. Now, we're not claiming this is representative of all land managers. We were looking at a particular set of land managers with particular challenges. And so within that group that we looked at, environmental and stewardship um, was seen as particularly important. But here again, we see the ability to capture value added, the profit per hectare, et cetera. So it gives some idea of what you know, the important factors are on average for this group, but also what we're really kind of interested in is what happens individually. Now, we won't talk too much about the unweighted and unweighted at, at the moment, but this is just basically, again, looking at it, but just within each uh, uh, subdomain, in, in, within each domain in the subdomain, if we just look at what's important with that, we can get a feel for what's going on. So again, we will talk about this later. So as I said, it's kind of you know interesting to begin through this process with these individual managers is that we can begin to compare what it is that's important to them. And this is a graph of the individual results at the domain level. I mean, it looks like spaghetti, um, but you know it kind of emphasizes our point. People have very different uh, things that are important to them when they're thinking about land use change. And if we have new systems, then they're going to have to sort of uh, fit with the perceptions of the land managers in order for them likely to be adopted. And we can show again this at the subdomain level as well and the importance of the various components in that. So these are the types of outcomes, you know, the, the numbers that come out of using our AHP in this way. But of course, what's more uh, interesting to us and more used to us is thinking, how is it actually being used? So as I said, we've worked with a number of land managers in very different situations. Some have got new irrigation schemes, some under environmental regulation, some trying to work out what to do with relatively land that's relatively unproductive at the moment. Can they make it more productive and so forth? So one thing you can do, for example, is you can use this approach to rate a next generation system against the values, the criteria that farmers feel are important. So in here, you might, for example, identify a number of steps involved in this, you might identify a possible next generation system, identify the criteria as important with the land manager and weight those criteria overall. So go through that process that we've been through, how important do they think payback period is, how important do they think uh, nitrogen leaching is, etc. And when what we do, so we find out what's important to the land manager here, but then we can go through a process for that system and think at how well it performs within each of those criteria as well. And then we can look at its performance under each of these criteria against how much importance the land manager places on that to get 
a weighting of each alternative under each I criteria. And then in a sense, the closer the system matches the things that are important to the land manager, then the better that system will be. It's a little uh, complicated to think about here, but the re there is reading um, in the, at the end, which we will describe, which highlights this in more detail, but we can show this graphically. So fundamentally, we went through a process looking at two land managers, as just to give an example, and sheep dairy, dairy sheep, as an alternative system. So basically, we went through the process with two land managers who were considering uh, dairy sheep. And here we can see in this blue and these gray lines how their weights came out of this uh, system. Then, Basically, we uh, just talked with, uh, just to highlight the process, we talked with an expert and went through against all these criteria, how well they thought sheep dairy would actually fit against this criteria. In this system, we just use a sort of a scoring system of one to five, saying if this system fitted uh, that criteria very well, so was it quite profitable? then it would, you know, if it's highly profitable, relatively profitable, it would score highly in this area. And so, on, so basically everything was rated out of five. And we can see here, once we normalize this, this is the orange is the scoring for sheep dairy. Okay. So we can see how well it's scored here. And then against how much weight importance was placed on these by land managers. And effectively, we can then, by weighting how well the, the system performs against the criteria, by how much weight an individual puts on that criteria, we can develop an overall score for it. So as we said, in this, we were scoring it out from one to five. So the nearer to five that the system scored in relation to our land manager, the better it fit. It. Okay, and we can see here, our overall scores were 3.69 and 3.79, which highlighted that it fitted pretty well for both our land managers. As I said, there's more reading on this, but we're just trying to highlight how we can use this tool. So it allows us, and again, if we had a whole range of these alternative enterprises, you know, dairy, goat, manuka, we could score them all against the criteria and the scores, weights given by the land managers to see preliminarily which ones fitted better. We can also use it to really give us deeper insights into um, what's actually driving change. So in this example, really we were looking, and again, there's reading at the end um, in, in the, this is about an irrigation system and about understanding how land managers choose to use that water. And a big issue in New Zealand has been the move to the dairy and some of the environmental pressures with that. So we can go through the process and understand in a sense what's pulling people towards dairy and what might be pushing them away. And so we went through a whole load of criteria and looked at this. And also as you go through the process and we'll talk about this more, you have a discussion with the land managers and then you can get into again, it's not just a number when they get this weight, there's a reason behind why that number has been given. And what this uh, allows us to do is to really understand what it is, the motivations that are going on in that decision making. We can understand what's keeping them in dairy or pushing, you know, pulling them towards dairy. But, you know, we can then begin to understand how environment or regulation issues are beginning to change that decision making. And again, there's a reading at the end on this particular case study, which will give much more detail on it. So we talked about this idea that we were kind of interested in whether science can help. And so it does give us further insight. So again, by going through this process, we can understand what is important to the decision maker. And then we can think about, will new knowledge or information help support the decision maker if they were thinking of changing the system? So for example, we might find um, 
you know, what's important to decision making? If they're in an environmentally highly regulated area, it might be the key driver is how much nitrogen is leached from that land system, okay? If we have a new system, do we actually know how much nitrogen is being leached? So we may well be the case, maybe science is needed to show that this new system has low leaching, therefore the farmer, the land manager could be confident in adopting it, yeah? So if we don't know the answers, then what science is needed? Okay. So in some cases, as we mentioned there, it might be about your well, production. You know, maybe it's a new crop. People don't know how to grow it, okay? How suitable it might be for the farm system. As we said before, again, it might be about the environment. What are greenhouse gas emissions? What's it leaching? It might be, actually, it's not a production issue, it's a supply chain issue. Maybe there's no processing, maybe there's no logistics. Again, is there actually a market for this? If we have research that helps fill these gaps, then we can reduce the risk to the land manager of trans transforming, maybe not remove it entirely, but if we reduce the risk, then maybe we're going to speed up this transformation to these more desirable land uses. I just want to emphasize again that, you know, a key thing about the use of the tool and the way we used it is not just those numbers, those weights that came out, but the fact that there's an interactive approach uh, using our graphical interface and discussion basically allows a detailed discussion of what's driving them. So we get a really a good idea of what the land manager was thinking when they're making their decisions. So it's not just the end number, but the whole process here and then the quotes about the journey rather than the end. And I think that's a key thing about it. One of the things you can do with analytical hierarchical process, as we said before, is that when you go through the process, effectively it's a pairwise comparison. How important is financial against the environment? How important is environment against market, et cetera? And because it's a mathematical process and you're weighting them, you can begin to work out whether people were consistent in their choices going through the framework. And that can help give you confidence that the results you get are kind of uh, meaningful because they were able to consistently compare the different domains or subdomains that you were looking at. Yeah? And so we were kind of kind of interested to go back after we've used this tool a bit and think about how consistent were they overall? Because if they weren't consistent, it might indicate that the tool isn't particularly useful or may not work that well in our situations. So we are able, um, so we're thinking about things like, you know, how consistent were respondents overall? Did this consistency change as participants went through the process or did they get tired? Because they have to make a lot of comparisons. Were some domains generally more consistent than others? Um, were some respondents more generally consistent or inconsistent than others? And the question is, is it the final, you know, is it a deal breaker here? I don't want to spend too long on this in this, and we will come back to how we measure it in the tool later. But basically, as we said, it allows us to, it's based on this idea of transitivity. If you say financial is more important than market and that market is important more than environment, then it should be for you as an individual that financial is more important than environment. This is based on the process of, of transitivity, yeah? And Sarte, based on this process, I'm a little bit more complicated than that, basically developed an indices, an index, um, and it's basically the consistency ratio is from this, from naught, where it means you're completely consistent in your choices to one where you're completely random. Uh, Sarte himself argues if you have a consistency of about 0.1 on that scale, which means you're pretty consistent, then that's relatively acceptable. But there's quite a lot of discussion about it. I just want to look basically about the overall consistency that we achieve. Now, 0.1 is an indicator, which is our blue here. We went up to point two. So we, I think we saw generally higher levels of relatively high levels of consistency in our samples, which kind of suggests that the tool works and they are able to use it to make those trades. Now it did vary between domains and we will talk more about this may have a, uh, some bearing on how you construct 
the different uh, domains and what you put inside them. And we will come back to this. Another use, and it has been more widely used, I think, this tool in this way, is that it can help group decision making. Yeah. Basically, um, what we did here is with groups of land managers who had control over lands, it might be trustees or others, we basically went through the process with them individually to see how they scored uh, the, the different criteria. And then through a process of discussion, we then were able to arrive at an overall um, view. And so we have here in this graph, the results for four individuals that um, we were involved in who was trustees of a particular organization. And the red line is the group average. So they scored each one individually and then uh, discussed. So what we're trying to argue is that the good use of this is for group discussion making. And in a later video, we will talk much more about how you do this and the advantages and disadvantages of it. But it is a useful tool for thinking with people that are working together over land use decision making. Are they thinking the same? You know, if one has huge uh, importance on financial up here, puts all their weight on here, and another has all their weight on environment, how are they going to get on when it comes to making decisions? Whereas in this group, we can see quite a strong correlation relationship between what they were thinking, very environmentally motivated and socially motivated here. But that's for this particular group. So, just want to finish our, our brief overview of this by thinking about some advantages and sort of um, of the framework before considering a little bit of some of the pressures. Okay. What we can do with this is identify criteria that are important in influencing the adoption of use systems. And we can draw attention to the these things are important. We need objective information to support decision making. It can highlight where there are potential gaps in our knowledge and where science can help. You can also think about how well a particular system fits with land users' needs. And even if they're in it now, will they have to change perhaps? And can think about how new technologies can shift systems so they better meet the criteria set by land managers. And also we can use it potentially for decision makers at different levels, maybe council, land managers, wider stakeholders, to see on whether or not we can get some agreement about what they want to see from land use. This said, there are some challenges with using the framework. It is a particular methodology. This idea of making pairwise comparisons it's time consuming, particularly if you have a number of sub criteria you want to use. For example, in our, our process, actually respondents had to do a hundred comparisons like this. Um, so that can be time consuming. Again, it's not possible to choose all criteria. So choice of criteria is very important. Also, we're always arguing that you can trade one off against the other or not have to make a decision in a way. But some decisions might be more binary in nature, I, what we call red lines, you know. It doesn't matter how well it scores on all these other things or the other criteria. If it doesn't make, for example, this return on the investment, then it's not going to go through. So we're always trying to argue, I guess there's some sort of trade-offs going on here, but some people may have particular red lines. It might be around the environment, it might be around financial, but it might be around supply chain. And so that may actually mean that's a no-go, even if the thing scores relatively well around all the other criteria. And again, this process of trading off, some people found um, difficult. As we see in the quote here, some person felt, you know, there's such a strong link between their social well-being and their financial performance, trying to trade them off is difficult. That said, the, for, you know, the process says you can stay in the middle in this case and emphasize they are both equally important to you. Again, there's a little challenge with thinking about making sure that the person you're talking to identifies the criteria in the same way and how you interpret the graphs uh, and how you present the results back. And we will talk more about this in a later um, video. So, Really what I've just tried to do in this video is present a quick
quick overview of how the framework has been used and the context of New Zealand. You know, in following videos, uh, mainly in module two, we will look more closely at the practicalities of using the framework and how it can be adapted for other uses. And so the things we've talked very briefly about here, consistency, using the tool, et cetera, we will give much more detail so you can be confident about how you use it. And as I said, there's a number of further reading um, about, about this. So for example, the sheep, um, dairy example we can find uh, in this paper, 2.2a, uh, next generation systems. We're looking at the uh, irrigation system we can find in this one, central plains water, and a more general one thinking about how the framework's used we can find here. So this will give you some more detail and hopefully put in context what I've talked about here. And again, as I was highlighting at the beginning, this was um, work funded by the Our Land and Water National Science Challenge. And hopefully you will enjoy uh, the reading materials that uh, go with this video. 